Hi, I'm Steve from Jackson Interface Shelter, and today with me is Cassie Watson. She's the Executive Director for Integrated Health and Outpatient Services at LifeWays. And she's also a member of the board at Jackson Interface Shelter. So excited to have her here today. So thanks for being with us. Absolutely. So Cassie, starting out, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you get in, got into uh, the mental health services world? Sure. Um, that was actually kind of by accident. So um, I never really expected when I started down my career path um, to end up in the mental health field. So I was um, going to school for my master's in public health. Um, I was actually working at the hospital as a clerical associate, and I saw a position for quality improvement specialist at LifeWays. Um, and it really fits with my skill set, so data analysis, um, problem solving, and so I applied and, and got in as a quality improvement specialist um, in 2016. And um, from there, I was promoted to director of integrated health. Um, I oversaw uh, it's called PBHCI, but primary behavioral health care integration grant um, as project director, and then. Um, we went through some restructuring and I applied and was hired in as the executive director of integrated health and outpatient services. So I uh, really have had my entire career mm -hmm. at LifeWays, um, you know, educationally even too. Okay. You're currently also working on another degree as well, just because you like schooling so <laughs> yeah. much. Is that right? Yeah. So I have my bachelor's in human biology from Michigan State University, my master's in public health from Michigan State University, um, my associate's degree in nursing and my registered nurse's license from um, Jackson College. And I'm working on my master's of science in nursing um, at Eastern Michigan University. So you yeah. have a two-year-old at home, right? <laughs> I have a two-year-old at home, yeah. Uh, my husband and I have a two-year-old son, and uh, yeah, so balancing all of that. And thank you for serving on the board, despite yes. having a lot of time in life. Um, so can you, for anybody that isn't real familiar with what LifeWays does, can you just give a bit about the history of LifeWays Mental Health? Um, who does it serve? You know, is it just a Jackson County thing? How is it funded? So just, sure. yeah, high, high level view. So LifeWays serves Jackson and Hillsdale counties, um, and LifeWays is what's called a community mental health. And so they serve really the uninsured, underinsured individuals who have uh, mental health conditions or who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, that's now expanded into individuals with substance use disorders or co-occurring substance use disorders and mental health disorders. Um, and we've also uh, really diversified the people walking through our doors. So it's not just people that are underinsured. It's not just people with Medicaid. Um, it's individuals who have private insurance plans. Mm -hmm. It's individuals um, who uh, their private insurance plans don't cover all of the services that they need or maybe even um, to the level of their need. So uh, LifeWays provides, uh, gosh, outpatient therapy, mental health outpatient therapy, substance use outpatient therapy. Um, we provide crisis services, psychiatric services. Um, and then through our provider network, we also provide um, children's specific services, so home-based services. Um, and we have, I think, over 40 providers. So it really, the ser any service that someone needs that has a behavioral health um, component, we right. have either provided internally or through our network of providers. Okay. Um, so LifeWays, um, funding-wise, we have funding through the state, um, through Medicaid, Medicare dollars. We have funding through general fund dollars that are local dollars that we can use. We have um, a mental health millage that was passed in 2017, I think, okay. um, and then we also have grant programming that allows us to diversify the services that we provide. Um, we have an engagement team that mm -hmm. goes out into the community and engages with folks, comes here on site at the shelter. Okay. Um, we have a mobile crisis team that goes where the need is. We do services in the jails um, in Jackson and Hillsdale County. Um, really, really, we're everywhere. Yeah. Now it feels like, um, and I'm probably missing so many services um, because we just have expanded so rapidly. Can you, I would expect you to know exact numbers on this, but roughly how large is the staff of LifeWays and roughly how many people do you serve a year? It could be quite a rough estimate. Yeah. So, you have to do that. so I know for LifeWays internally, we have um, approximately, I would say almost 200 people. Okay. Um, that's not all clinical folks. Um, obviously, you know, 
we need the administrative folks. They provide the support yeah. um, and oversight. Um, and then for a number of individuals served, I, I want to say that people walking through our doors over 6,000 per mm -hmm. year. Um, I could be off on that, but I, I know um, there are internal programs that serve 2,000 people. Um, so, and then again, with our provider network, there are just so many people that um, are served through our community too. So with your provider network, is that kind of a sub subsidiary that you fund to provide counseling services and other things? And yeah. can you get, you said there's 35 to 40 plus. So what are a few of those providers that people might have heard of before? Sure. So we, so some of our providers provide services through life choice funding, mm -hmm. plus their own funding sources, private insurances, grants, um, other dollars. And some are solely funded by LifeWays. Um, so in terms of provider types, uh, the large ones, um, we've got Segway. Um, what do they focus on? Segway has several different programs. And um, you know if they watch this, they're going to be like, she missed like half of what we do. Um, but they have like assertive community treatment, which is one of the highest intensity services that we can provide. Um, these are people that need a lot of engagement, a lot of oversight, um, a lot of assistance. Mm -hmm. um, they provide case management, um, outpatient therapy. Um, recovery technology has case management, outpatient therapy. Um, they also have a, an assertive community treatment team. Um, they share a building with you, right? Recovery technology. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So in Jackson, half of our building is there. Um, Integro is another one which provides um, outpatient therapy, uh, home based services for children, which is a higher intensity um, child focused service. Um, High Fields does case management, um, they do child focused services as well, home-based, um, I want to say infant mental health. Okay. Um, and then we have respite providers, we have um, adult foster care providers, um, just so many now, um, too many to count and all of them do you know, fabulous, fabulous work and so I, I hate to just throw out just a couple of them, but. That's helpful. So with some of the services like uh, crisis services. So I know one of the things we've been appreciative at the shelter is there's a crisis hotline. So if it's something that isn't necessarily needing police intervention because it's not quite escalated to that point, there's a 24-7 hotline where somebody from LifeWays can actually come and connect and help to de-escalate situations and walk people through your things. So can you guys, I guess, talk a little bit more about what some of those extreme crisis services do? And then also, um, you had a beautiful addition to your building in the last year or two. Yeah. I mean, a complete gut renovation. Um, and then a 24 seven overnight place for several mm -hmm. days that um, that's new. So if you could kind of talk to some of that, and I, I know some might not be hundred percent up and running and, and COVID's made some of that stuff tricky, but what's, what is happening, what's new and then what's to come once things are fully staffed. Sure. So, you know, obviously we're, we're dealing with sh uh, staffing shortages, just like most mental health agencies, but um, we have a mobile crisis team that's focused on adults in crisis. Um, and then we also have what's called an ICSS team, which is focused on um, children in crisis. Uh, so it's intensive, intensive crisis stabilization services, which is all focused on children. Um, those function at different time frames just because of staffing um, issues. Um, there's a lot of initiatives at the state level to expand crisis services, ensure they're 24-7. And then we have the on-site crisis residential unit, which is essentially inpatient level care. So someone needs inpatient level care, but this is a community diversion option mm -hmm. um, that we can provide and provide oversight to someone who really needs um, intensive monitoring and, and assistance, but we're hoping will do well in a less... Um, restrictive environment right. um, because we don't have enough hospital beds across mm -hmm. the state of Michigan. People are you know, sitting in ERs um, for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. and we're working quickly on that, but it's that's a burden on the hospital staff. It's also a burden on uh, the mental health staff that are in the community working on these things. So, um, so the crisis residential unit is really a diversion option. Yeah. And then um, uh, we also have what's called a like living room area, mm -hmm. so people can come on site eight to eight to seven, and if they just need to decompress, mm -hmm. they can stay there for up to twenty three hours. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a sensory room that helps people kind of de uh, de escalate, just mm -hmm. kind of get to where they're they're feeling better and and go on um, about their day or um, you know receive the services that they need. So we have that option as well. Um, I think that kind of covers our crisis services. 
What are some of the things that you've seen, you know, since starting your work with mental health the last several years, there's you know, a lot of increase in opioid addictions and things like that. And so I guess specifically looking at, you know, Jackson Hillsdale where you're mm -hmm. over, just, I guess, what, what have been some observations, positive trends, negative trends? And, and, yeah. yeah. So since COVID, so originally when COVID started, um, I was on, actually on maternity leave and we saw kind of, I, I don't want to say reduction in services, but essentially not as many people seeking crisis services, mm -hmm. not as many people seeking services in general, mm -hmm. um, which across the nation, we saw that that trend was happening. And so there was a lot of talk, is this a protective factor that people are home more and they're getting the interaction with their families that they need is, you know, is there some protective factor? Um, and then we saw about year one, year and a half after COVID started, um, that that was not the case and that people that had just been delaying care. And we saw that from the physical health side of things, but also mental health. And so we're seeing an influx of individuals walking through our door with anxiety, um, with, um, the trauma that hasn't been addressed with uh, mental health needs that just have gone um, undiagnosed because they you know, were just functioning. Well, we were all functioning in crisis. Mm -hmm. um, the pandemic really challenged all of us. And so some of us that already had mental health conditions, it really just um, increased their severity um, and sometimes even caused them to manifest maybe earlier than they would have. Mm -hmm. um, so we see more people coming through substance use disorders. We know that those are on the rise um, with COVID. Um, and even prior to COVID itself, um, the Jackson County um, Opioid Task Force, um, I can't remember the entire name of it, but um, they had shown that there was an upward trend in opioid related deaths um, in Jackson County alone. So we know that the opioid crisis was worsening as it was. And then with COVID, it's, it's gotten even worse, um, but we have new resources like Andy's Place um, mm -hmm. is, you know, being developed, continuing to expand their programming. Um, Can you talk about your, yeah, finish what you're saying, yeah. maybe hit on Andy's Place a little bit too for anybody that might not know. But, yeah. yeah, so, and then, um, and I won't do them as much justice either, so you'll have to bring them yeah. in too. But, um, and then, you know, we, we also have substance use services that we provide on site now, which we did not prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, the licensing process just took a little bit longer. And um, so we provide short-term therapy and treatment for individuals with um, substance use. So um, so there are some things happening in the community, but um, still a long way to go to really addressing the the drug needs, you know, or I say drug needs, but like substance use needs, drug, um, drug addictions um, that people have. Um, and then for Andy's place, um, so I can't speak in depth because I, I just don't know as much about their functioning, um, but Andy's place offers an opportunity for, um, you know, basically uh, sober living mm -hmm. opportunities with additional supports, mental health supports, um, you know, transitioning um, through that process of becoming sober, um, support for, uh, I think, job seekers as well. So they have um, kind of a, a neat setup um, mm -hmm. and worked really, really diligently in, uh, to, to get to where they are now um, in the middle of COVID. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think that they're, they're going to be a wonderful resource. They are, we already have a partnership with them. We're already talking, you know, with them about how to expand services. Um, and like I said, I, I can't go into it all in depth because um, I am new to my position as well. So I'm mm -hmm. still learning some of the community resources that we have. Okay. Great. Um, what, um, what have you kind of seen with the connection between mental health and homelessness? Is that um, I know within interface shelter, forty to fifty percent plus of the folks that we see are either you know diagnosed or self-diagnosed as mental uh, have mental illness. A lot of people might associate homelessness with you know somebody that they see downtown that um, maybe panhandling or showing some signs of mental illness. But I guess how does that tie into the work that you do? Has it or is that something that you kind of see? you know, down the road kind of tying in as Jackson and other cities just kind of think through the help uh, folks that are, you know, living on the street that have a mental illness. Sure. So when we look at people, we're trying to look at them holistically. So mm -hmm. what that means is that I can't address 
your mental health needs mm -hmm. if you don't have the ability to turn on a light in your home, if you don't yeah. have the ability to have running water in your home that's clean. Mm -hmm. um, so when I when we look at someone, it's addressing their whole health needs. Mm -hmm. We need to meet you emotionally. We need to meet you socially, um, financially, um, it, you know, everywhere that you are at as an individual. And so when we bring someone in, we're looking at them and assessing, okay, what is your home, home life? Mm -hmm. um, is it that you're homeless? And you're living in your car. Well, now that's our priority. Mm -hmm. So we want to connect you to the mental health services that we have, but we also recognize that if you don't have a home to go home to, right. that we can give you the ther all the therapy in the world and it's not going to have as big of an impact as making sure you have a safe place to go and sleep and then addressing your therapy needs. Um, mm -hmm. So most of that happens concurrently, it happens mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, where we have case managers working on linking, monitoring, coordinating services for individuals, right. and then providing, you know, if it's therapy or if it's medication management or if it's a combination of multiple services um, to then meet the mental health, behavioral health needs. Um, as far as homelessness goes, I, you know, I don't know how many um, off the top of my head of our consumers are listed as homeless. Um, I don't. Uh, I, I don't think it's fair to say um, that everyone that's homeless has mental health disorders, and I don't right. think it's fair to say that everyone that has mental health disorders is homeless, right? right. We know that's not true. Um, and I think there's a lot of stigma that comes with talking about homelessness and about mental health. Um, there's a lot of assumptions made, um, and that's kind of what we're trying to combat is that just because you have a mental health disorder doesn't mean that you meet all of these things that people assume. Right. Um, and so my job um, and my passion is really challenging the stigmas that we have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, the same thing with, with substance use. There are so many stigmas around su substance use and so many assumptions made about the people who use substances. And that is something that I, I want to challenge that I, I, as a community we have to approach is that we can't continue to say it's just a choice. Um, there are physiologic changes happening and brains need maintenance just the same way that our bodies need maintenance. So addressing people as a whole and looking at them as people and, um, you know, biologically, psychosocially, right. that's, that's the key. Um, so we shouldn't put anyone in a box, um, but we should recognize that there are um, areas in which in the community in which we should be present because there is a, more, a higher likelihood of mental health crises or substance use crises going on because of the situational things that they're going through. Yep. That's great. Um, a lot of people talk about trauma-informed care mm -hmm. with, within basically every different field. For, so for people that might not just know exactly, you know, what does that mean? Would you give a just kind of quick rundown of, you know, how would you describe trauma-informed care when you're working with people? I think it's, it ties hand in hand with um, person-centered care, mm -hmm. again, and just kind of again, addressing people from where they're at, where they're coming from. So um, being trauma-informed, a lot of it's training around that. It's getting certified to provide trauma-informed care, but it's recognizing that not everyone that walks in the door has the exact same life experiences, um, and even that Someone walking through the door could have experienced a car accident that didn't impact them, but someone else who was in the exact same car accident was impacted in a different way. Um, and that's just a, a small example, but but each individual responds to a situation or responds to uh, lifelong trauma differently. Um, and we can't, again, assume um, when they walk through our door that X treatment is going to work or they're just going to get over it. Um, and I think that is a struggle for people because we, we do kind of have a one-minded track of yeah. you follow these steps and you're going to get better and it does, doesn't always work that way. Sometimes it requires a detour to get back to the road to that person's individual recovery. Um, so trauma-informed care is really just looking at it from that lens of um, person-centered, um, each experience is different and making sure that we take into account the whole being before we start to go down the path of recovery. So as we wrap up, any just kind of other things that you'd like to share for anybody in the community, either looking to get more involved in serving, looking to get, uh, you know, help personally, you know, through LifeWays or one of your subsidiaries or just other perspectives on things you've learned. So this is an open-ended question. 
Anything come to mind? Oh, I haven't asked I sure. about that you'd like to hit on. <laughs> I well, honestly, it's challenging our our inner um, assumptions. We mm -hmm. we're human. Bias exists. Mm -hmm. it, it exists everywhere that we go, um, and it's not always something we ourselves recognize. So I think being self-aware is absolutely essential for individuals who are um, trying to do good for their communities. So mm -hmm. self-aware of the, the assumptions that we have um, or exposing ourselves to uncomfortable situations or uncomfortable questions. Um, you know, Bridges Out of Poverty is a extraordinary training and that makes you challenge some things that yeah. you have. Like, it just ways you've always done things. So I think if people can go to Bridges Out of Poverty training, I think that's great. I think if people can um, go to the places that they feel uncomfortable because they don't know, um, you know, there's a big focus and should be on LGBTQ plus mm -hmm. um, that population as well. Mm -hmm. That is one of our populations that's underserved, um, highly stigmatized and experiencing extraordinarily mental health uh, crises right now in the nation. Um, so I want to challenge again people's assumptions and um, their narratives, right? Of well, I they they can go get help. Okay, that that's true. People can go get help. Do they always know that it's available? Do they always feel supported in getting help? You know, so really as a community, it's our obligation to be supportive no matter what. And and you know, again, that's kind of my goal is to support. Um, where there's a need and to challenge the assumptions we've made and how we've always done it, I, you know. Um, and I think for people that are seeking services, LifeWays is a resource. We're there to help and we don't always get it right. It's not always perfect and I know that, um, but we are actively trying and seeking out ways to improve the services we do provide. Um, we don't want bad experiences to make someone feel uncomfortable coming to LifeWays. Um, but every place has that. So I think, you know, having a bit of grace and, you know, having the courage to also come tell us yeah. out of that experience. I want people to not have my experience. Mm -hmm. um, but then also recognizing that we're an entirely new agency. We've gone through a lot of growth, um, a lot of expansion, and um, we offer phenomenal services. We have phenomenal staff and phenomenal providers in our network who are there to, to help people. So I think that's really what I want um people to hear is that you know we're not going to be perfect but we uh, we do care and we do want people to come through our doors if they need help well thank you for what you do thank you for your service to the community thanks for taking time today yeah absolutely